Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome. I think we'll. Uh, uh, I think we'll get started. Thanks so much for coming, and uh, welcome to the fourth installment of the 2009-2010 NYU Reynolds Program in Social Entrepreneurship Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Gable Broadbar. I'm the director of the Reynolds Program. Uh, which is sponsoring today's event. Uh, I'm also somebody who's been deeply moved by Chris Jordan's work. I had the good fortune uh, of seeing it for the first time at uh, last year's Pop Tech conference. Uh, and quite frankly, I was blown away. He's, uh, he's a true artist and activist, and somebody who I think provides a great example of the third type of Reynolds change maker. These are people who spur others to action through media and the arts. Uh, from my perspective, he's got this almost uncanny ability to take the abstract and transform it into the intuitive. And I think you're going to hear and see some very provocative things today. Before I formally invite him to the podium, however, I just want to take a quick minute and tell you a, a tiny bit about the Reynolds Program. The Reynolds Program attracts, trains, and funds graduate and undergraduate students from across NYU who want to become the next generation of social entrepreneurial leaders. So you may be asking yourself, well, what's a social entrepreneur? Well, this being an NYU Reynolds event, it's possible you're sitting next to one, or you're trying to be one, or you are one. Uh, in sum, I think what social entrepreneurs are are people who find new ways to solve some of the most difficult social problems and environmental problems that we have. And they do so in ways that try to attack the root cause of the problem and not just the symptoms. So what do I mean by that? Um, a social entrepreneur who's concerned about a broken foster care system doesn't start a new foster care agency. That social entrepreneur is going to figure out ways to use data to ensure services are delivered more effectively across the entire system. Or a social entrepreneur that's concerned about access to medical care isn't going to simply get doctors to areas where they're badly needed, although that's good. That social entrepreneur might build a new cell phone network so doctors all over the globe can more easily share life-saving information about their, about their patients. Or a social entrepreneur that's concerned about the ill effects of development aid in Africa isn't simply going to aware, uh, raise, uh, raise awareness about the issue. That social entrepreneur is going to figure out ways to create, create new investment tools so capital flows into those regions to support the local economies. Now, these are examples that, of things that fellows and scholars are all doing right now. And they bring these ideas to the Reynolds program to turn them into reality and do so in ways that are sustainable and scalable. If this sounds like you, somebody you know, you just want to learn more, uh, I very much encourage you to check us out. We're at nyu.edu backslash Reynolds. Join our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, read our blog, all the, all the usual channels. Um, so to the reason we're here today, it's, uh, it's really a great privilege and honor to be able to introduce Chris Jordan. Uh, as I mentioned before, he's an artist and activist. And what he does is he creates these very powerful, very eye-opening digital images that help us to really understand how much we consume and what those numbers mean. Now, obviously, all of us here today and pretty much, pretty much everybody on the planet, we're all consumers. And we consume a lot. Every year, I was kind of poking around the internet, came up with some statistics. Every year, we consume five I think it was at 500 billion plastic bags each year. We chop down 100 million trees to make a year's worth of mail order catalogs in the US. Every five minutes, we throw away 2 million plastic water bottles. In 2007, we threw away something like 140 million cell phones and 270 million computer products in the US alone. Now, obviously, all of this stuff sounds like a lot, but what do the numbers really mean? And from my perspective, it's impossible to tell. It's impossible to understand them. And the reason it's impossible to understand them is, as human beings, we really aren't wired to comprehend such massive statistics. These numbers, they have to be translated. And they have to be translated in a way that communicates the meaning behind them. And I think that's where Chris's work comes in. His pictures provide that translation, really giving us the opportunity to understand, actually, I think, really feel what these numbers mean. And I think the work goes beyond that. I think the work also gives us this kind of needed distance, the distance to help us see how our individual consumption 
contributes to what turns out to be a pretty grotesque aggregate. I think it's impossible to look at his work and then see your own consumption behavior the same way again. You'll find yourself asking yourself, is that my plastic bag? How many water bottles did I use this year? What happened to the computer or the three cell phones that I got rid of over the last couple of years? When I was thinking about today's event, I was reminded of the economist Robert Guest, and he described, I love this line, he describes America as a Ponzi scheme that works. And others have suggested that it works because we borrow from the future. I think Chris wor Chris's work is really a very powerful statement attesting to the fact that those loans are, are terribly past due. And we're really in a position to decide if we're going to repay those loans in a way that's going to preserve or destroy that future. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the podium Chris Jordan. Let me just take one second to make sure my sound is on. Is it coming out of speakers? How about now? No? Dang it. Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you back there. Well, I'm, uh, I'm delighted and honored to be here. It's always really cool to uh, get to present my work in a university setting, and uh, especially because I, I get the smartest questions from guys like you, and that's really what pushes my work. And uh, so I, I, uh, I look forward to some questions from you guys. I think we have time for question and answer afterwards, and I want to go as fast as I can through the pictures to get to the, what to me is the real meat, and that's where we get to have a conversation. So um, what I want to do is to start back uh, with some photographs I was taking a few years ago, um, back before uh, I really had anything going on as an artist. Um, and uh, it's kind of astonishing to find myself in the, in, in the position I am in the world right now because just a little more than seven years ago, I was a very unhappy, close to suicidal corporate lawyer. And uh, I, at, for 11 years of my life, I was practicing insurance litigation, which is, I think, one of the most spirit deadening professions there is. And I was deeply immersed myself, very lost in uh, American consumer culture. I was just, uh, I, w I was stuck in my idea of the American dream, which was get a job that you don't have to like. In fact, the job I had, not only did I not, did I not like it, but it was in many cases that I worked on, it was directly contrary to my principles. I was doing work that turned my stomach. But I thought, you know, that's what work is. That's why they call it work, right? And I was making lots of money. And so I would work all week, and then on the weekend, one weekend I'd be in the stereo store buying a new stereo, and then the next weekend I'd be in the mountain bike shop buying, you know, the, the bitchinest new titanium mountain bike, and then the next weekend I'd be at the tile store buying exotic Italian tile for my, the backsplash of my kitchen, and so on. It was just like this constant cycle of, of, of making money and spending it on stuff. And I thought that was the road to happiness. And you know, I, I realized now I had been taught this from all these thousands of different sources that, were, that I, was, I was not awake to. I wasn't conscious that I had developed this belief system. And so I was kind of lost in it. And all of this time, I wasn't finding happiness. I was becoming more and more unhappy. And uh, I was incredibly angry. I had this deep rage inside of me that came out as as meanness to the people I love. And uh, I contemplated suicide a lot. And one of the reasons I didn't commit suicide is because I have a son. And uh, I didn't want him to lose his dad. But I just kept having this thought in the back of my mind, like, what about me? You know, do I get to live a life? And uh, there was something about turning 40. 40 started looming on the horizon. And I realized, uh, you know, I better get my, my life together, because this is it. And so I got myself into a therapist. And uh, with, the, with, with that work, I was uh, able to get myself out of the legal profession and began doing what I love full time. I'd been photographing for many years before that. And uh, I finally decided to turn to it full time. And the, the photographic work I was doing all those years was, it, it, it was a reflection of the life that I was living, which is very detached from, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was not 
in any way uh, taking on any kind of responsibility as a, as a citizen. You know, I never voted. In, in all the years I practiced law, I didn't vote in a single election, whether state, local, or, or federal. Um, and uh, I just, I wasn't interested in doing anything uh, on behalf of anyone except myself. I lived this very self-centered lifestyle. And my photographic work kind of reflected that. It was very aesthetic. You know, it was, it was detached, you know, it was that kind of detached art that uh, I had a, 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 a color theory that I worked with all that time. And I like to look back and affectionately refer to as my cosmic color theory. And it's one of those art theories that, you know, when you go to the art gallery and you read the artist statement on the wall of the gallery and you have no idea what the person's talking about, it was like that. A kind of intellectual, abstract, hoity-toity theory that was really, I realize now, was a, a form of uh, escapism. Um, and, uh, and so that's the work I was doing. I was going around taking photographs that fit my cosmic color theory. And uh, one of the places that I found that kind of color was in these industrial areas of, uh, of Seattle, in the port of Seattle. I'd go driving around the port, and I'd find these rail cars and shipping containers and these brightly colored industrial objects that perfectly fit my cosmic color theory. And sometime in the process of exploring around the port of Seattle, I took this photograph. And the only reason I took this picture was because it perfectly fit my cosmic color theory. And it, in fact, it was the best picture that I'd ever taken in terms of my cosmic color theory because it was, a, it was a more sophisticated, subtle palette of color than I had found before. And part of my cosmic color theory is to find these, these beautiful and complex palettes of color on the most mundane subjects possible. And here was this kind of impressionist painting palette of color on a pile of garbage. So I loved this photograph, and, uh, and so I made a, a big print of it and hung it on the wall of my studio. Well, I, have a, I had a couple of friends at the time who I was printing for who were both uh, internationally respected, engaged photographic activists. And they were over together one day picking up some prints, and they both walked right up to this print and, uh, and started talking about mass consumption. And it was kind of annoying to me at the time because they were misinterpreting my work. <laughs> and so I started talking to them about my cosmic color theory, and they'd both heard it lots of times before. And, and, uh, and they were as uninterested in my cosmic color theory at the time as the rest of the world was, which, uh, which was no interest at all. And, and we had kind of an argument about it a little bit. And finally, one of them, in a really sweet way, put his arm around my shoulder. And he says, Chris, you know, it might just be good luck, but you finally made a relevant photograph. <laughs> and he urged me to, to follow this, because I had quit my job. And I was you know, trying to make it as an artist now. And, uh, and he said, this is a thread that you could follow. And he called this image a macabre portrait of America. And uh, it kind of hit me then. And so I decided to, to, uh, to go back and, and begin to study the detritus of our mass consumption. And at the same time I did that, I began reading about consumerism. And I discovered to my astonishment that there's this vast body of literature out there that goes back, you can trace it back like 75 years or 100 years in American culture of these visionary people who have been warning us about the deadening effects, the destructive effects of, of mass consumption, of overconsumption on our environment, on our culture, and on our individual spirits. And it was, it was amazing to me as I, as I began, as I began uh, reading the contemporary literature just from the last, say, 20 years or so about mass consumption. These books were written about our culture in generally, but, but they, might have well, they might as well have been written about me personally because they talked about the high rate of depression among wealthy professionals. The millions of Americans, including wealthy professionals who are on antidepressants, the high rates of suicide in professions like uh, the legal profession and accounting and, and so on. And, uh, and this, this issue began to kind of materialize before my eyes, an issue that I had been completely asleep to that was totally invisible to me for my entire life up until age 38 and a half. This issue began to materialize before me and I realized that it, it, it was something that's not just out there, it's something that had been profoundly affecting my own life. And, and the more I began to read about it, the more alarmed and, and frightened I became to see this, this huge issue that is, uh, it's permeated our entire culture. And so uh, my own personal aesthetic 
began to kind of descend into a darker, more visceral place. And I, I left behind the cosmic color theory and uh, I began looking for, for images that kind of more reflected the, the horror that I had begun to wake up to. Um, I wanted to point out just a couple of uh, aesthetic devices that I began using in this series because uh, what I wanted this series to be was uh, a, a series of photographs that capture the scale of our mass consumption. And when I first began this project, in a kind of naive way, when I was standing in front of these giant piles of garbage in Seattle, I was thinking, that is the scale of our mass consumption. And it didn't take me long to realize, you know, as, as, I, as I began going around to various different uh, waste transfer stations in Seattle, and to visit our landfill, and to start reading about the, the amount uh, just of garbage that's created in Seattle, I began to realize that I wasn't standing in front of the scale of our mass consumption of all, at all. I was just standing in front of, like this image for example, standing in front of a, one very small portion of one day of Seattle's garbage. And there's actually a garbage train that leaves Seattle every day headed for a landfill down in Oregon and it's a mile long. A mile long train of our garbage every single day leaves Seattle and, and it's never all piled up in one place. You know, it comes in, in, uh, in trucks and is put in there with front loaders, so there's nowhere you could go to even take a photograph of all of Seattle's garbage for one day, much less all of our garbage. You know, I sort of craved to be able to go to the Mount Everest of our garbage, you know, and take a picture of it all, or the, you know, the Grand Canyon of our, of our waste disposal, but there is no such place. And so I sort of, I very quickly ran up against a limitation as I did this series to try to figure out, well, I want to, I want to convey the scale of our mass consumption, and yet the, the, the full scale, the cumulative amount of our mass consumption that we all create is an invisible phenomenon. There's nowhere you can go and see it all in one place. It's divided out over, over hundreds of thousands or even millions of different locations. And so I, I decided that I wanted to try to evoke scale. And so one of the things I began doing is, uh, is filling the frame in a way that, you know, it goes off, uh, this one had the same thing, it goes off both edge, both sides and, and off the top um, to leave to your imagination how much garbage there actually is. And then I only leave a very small amount of ground for the viewer to metaphorically stand on just to create a kind of sense of, of claustrophobia. Um, and you can see that uh, at work in all of these. In this one, there's only a very small amount of air left to, for the viewer to metaphorically breathe, and the only nature in the image is marginalized off to one corner and it's out of focus. Marginalized off to the right. <coughs> and, uh, and then others of them, you know, I completely fill the frame and there's not anywhere for the viewer to stand. And uh, the, one of the other things that I, I was doing there is I was working with an 8x10 view camera. Um, which, uh, which takes a photograph on a sheet of film that's about you know, the size of a, a, a piece of printer paper. And, uh, and so the negative that you get uh, from working with this camera is this extremely finely detailed image. You can walk right up and see these, these exquisitely fine details in, uh, in a print, even a really large print. And so it has the effect of kind of drawing the viewer closer and closer. And by the time you finally get all the way up and are fully experiencing the detail of the image, then it's fully in your peripheral vision, sort of fully in your face. And, uh, I was, uh, that, and, and then also the, the kind of the pictorial beauty of the color. You can see I'm sticking with my cosmic color theory uh, kind of quietly through this whole project. Um, and uh, all of those things together were the, the idea was to kind of bring the viewer in, use them all as a way of bringing the viewer into an, a, uh, an uncomfortable conversation with themselves that they might not want to have otherwise. And uh, I call this series Intolerable Beauty, to sort of bring together the horror and the beauty uh, into one place to, uh, you know, kind of stir the soup a little bit. This is a pile of cell phone chargers that I uh, went and photographed in Atlanta. I finally, I, I started, uh, after a while, I started researching around the country and looking for places where I could travel to and photograph specific stuff. Um, because at the time we didn't have a, a cell phone uh, processing facility in Seattle, but there's one in Atlanta that I went back and forth to a couple times. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, and then here's another um, device that I began using that uh, I continue to use in my work, um, and that is the relationship between the near and the far. This is kind of deep zooming aspect. Um, and so with this particular image, when you stand back at a distance, what it hopefully looks like is uh, an aerial photograph as if you're uh, maybe flying over a, a, an, an industrial city of the future. 
or maybe the Death Star in Star Wars. Um, and, uh, and then when you get up close to the print and you see the fine details, what you realize you're actually looking at is lots of computer hard drives. And I'm really interested in that as a, as a visual metaphor because um, I came to our consumerism like that. Like I was standing back from our consumer culture for all of these years. And from that distance, you know, when I was a lawyer just spending money like crazy and buying all this nice stuff, consumerism looked pretty good to me. You know, it was like all the nice stuff I got to buy and the luxurious material lifestyle that I got to live and that we Americans get to live. And when you zoom in close and you look at any one detail of our mass consumption, whether it's the number of Americans on antidepressants, the number of people who say they're unhappy with the amount of hours that they work, you know, if you look at the social details or if you look at a, a particular uh, physical detail like, um, like, the, uh, like our electronic communications devices. This, this little clicker I'm using right here, it's a pretty cool thing to be able to stand here and click my slides without having to go behind the podium. And, but the, inside this little clicker and inside every one of our electronic communications devices, including all of our cell phones, is a mineral called coltan. And there's just an infinitesimally small amount of it that, uh, and, and most of the world's coltan comes from the Congo. And that's one of the reasons right now that the Congo is, a, is an environmental and cultural catastrophe. It's because of the mining of coltan. And the tribes are warring over who gets to own the land, and the mountain gorillas are going extinct because, in large part because of the mining of coltan. There's child slavery in the mines, and uh, it's just, it's this disaster that's happening over there. And so that's an example of like one issue that if you zoom in, you just get a really different picture than you saw when you were standing back at a distance. And I'm really interested in that as a visual metaphor, and I, I continue to work with that. You can see I'm still, uh, still holding on to my cosmic color theory <laughs> by one branch. Um, as a pile of cell phones that I went and photographed uh, at a different cell phone recycling facility. Um, and uh, what I did with this one is uh, I, I arranged it into a swirl. I spent uh, the better part of a day in there climbing around in these phones and arranging it into a swirl um, with the intention that it would uh, look like a galaxy and uh, to, to try to evoke the kind of the enormity and gravity and and uh, swirling aspect of a galaxy. And as I began exhibiting this work and speaking about it publicly, one of the things that I found myself doing was using the statistics that I had been reading about um, as a way of kind of bolstering the, the power of, of the images. And so what I would do, like when I showed this image, ex for example, um, I would say, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how many phones this is, only 3,000 or 2,000 phones or something like that. But that's just a tiny drop in the bucket of the actual number of phones that we throw out in the United States every day or every year, which at the time, every year, was around 140 million phones. And this, I mean, this is a tiny, tiny percentage of that. And so I w at the same time that I was trying to evoke the enormous scale of our mass consumption, I felt that I wasn't, and I was trying to kind of help it out by using these statistics. And every time I did that, I, I had this little craving in the back of my mind, like, where could I go and actually photograph that many phones? Like, wouldn't it be cool if the image itself would convey that scale without having to rely on a number? Because 130 million phones or 140 million phones, how many is that? You know, it's like this incomprehensible number. Like, if we filled this room up with, with phones, would it be 130,000? Or would it be 1.3 million? Or would it be 13 million? Like, I don't even know. Within a, within a factor of a thousand, I don't have any kind of intuitive sense of how many 130 million phones would be. And yet I'm using these statistics as a way of, of trying to affect people. And I realize it's not affecting me. And I, I, uh, it, it was a sort of a seminal moment for me was when I read the book New World, New Mind. I can't remember who the, who the authors are, but it's this really brilliant book that, uh, that basically unpacks the premise that the human mind can't comprehend numbers more than a few thousand. And they have all of these, these really uh, macabre examples that you guys have probably heard about. You know, they'll bring in 50 college students and they'll show them a picture of uh, a starving child. And they'll say, how much money would you donate to save this starving child? And the average amount is, uh, is something like $50. 
and then they'll bring in 50 more college students from the same demographic and they'll show them a picture of uh, 500 starving children. And they'll say, how much would you donate to save these 500 starving children? And the number goes down to like a dollar. And then they bring in 50 more students from the same demographic and they show them a picture of 10,000 starving children and they'll say, how much would you donate to save these 10,000 starving children? And the number averages to zero. It's like when the, as the number gets bigger, we get more and more distant. And, and part of it is that we, we simply can't comprehend the numbers more than a few thousand. And yet, every day, we speak to each other using numbers in the millions, hundreds of millions and billions. And now, you start to see the numbers in the trillions appearing. You know, when, we're, when, uh, when our federal government is talking about budgets now, they're using the numbers in the trillions for the first time that I've ever heard as if we understand what those numbers mean. You know, we kind of take for granted that we know what numbers in the hundreds of millions are. Um, and, uh, and yet, it's, it's fundamentally incomprehensible to us. So I was kind of wrestling with this as I got to the end of my Intolerable Beauty series. And, uh, and that's, that's when I hit on the idea of building these image, images digitally um, to try to, con to, to make photographs that depict the actual quantities of the things we consume. And, uh, and that's what led me into this series that I call Running the Numbers. And uh, one, of, one of the aesthetic things I wanted to do with Running the Numbers was to, to let go of, uh, of notions of beauty that I've been carrying around and with, with this Intolerable Beauty series. Because when I exhibited this work, um, I was always annoyed by the response that m what people mostly talked about was how beautiful the images were. And specifically with this one, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted discussion around mass consumption and self-reflection. And, uh, and, and, and what happened was people talked about the, the beautiful colors and the beautiful swirl and the, the exquisite fineness of the detail in the image. And, uh, and so I, I, uh, I wanted to kind of get rid of all of that and just make an image that showed the, the, the number of phones that we use. So I asked my cell phone guy to send me a box of silver phones, no more cosmic color theory. Not even a hint of it in this one. And uh, he sent me a, a, just a box about this size. You know, it was, it was like 200 phones. And uh, I dumped them out on my studio table, set my camera up looking straight down on them, and took a photograph of them. So now I've got a high quality digital 10 or 20 megapixel image of, uh, of 200 phones. Well, if I stir the phones around and take another picture, and then take those two pictures and join them together in Photoshop, and then stitch out the, the hard edge between them, well, then I've got a 40 meg megapixel image of 400 phones. And if I do that a lot for a few weeks, <laughs> then I finally end up with an image of the actual number of phones that we discard in the United States every day. And there it is, 426,000 cell phones one day of our cell phone consumption. One of the issues that I'm trying to raise, that I'm primarily interested in with this work, is the, the relationship between the individual and the collective. And, uh, you know, in the Green Movement, there's this message that, that the Green Movement is all about, that you keep hearing, which is how every individual matters. You know, every vote counts. And you too can save the world. And you know, it's this message of hope and empowerment, and it's, it's a good message. You know, there's a truth in it. But it, there's this other side to, to the, the world we live in right now that I feel personally that, that we kind of aren't talking about as a culture, and that is that I experience that I don't matter. You know, I am one over 6.7 billion, which is a really, really, really small number. And I wrestle with this question when I leave my studio, should I bother to, to uh, bend over and, and, and turn off the modem in my studio? Because it'll save this little tiny bit of electricity. And I think, think about those cities. Think about, uh, well, think about New York. Or think about those cities in China that I don't even know the name of. They have millions of people and the, the lights are on. There's gigawatts of electricity being burned and wasted all the time. Like, would it really make any difference? For me to, to bother to turn off my modem or to bother to recycle a plastic bottle, would, like, can I really make any difference of any kind? And uh, it's a question I really wrestle with. And, and I, think, 
I think it's a, it's a question that we unconsciously all wrestle with. Even the people in the Green Movement who are, who are uh, preaching this idea that everybody matters, it's like the way Al Gore says it. He says, we all know what to do. We just haven't found the political will to do it. We haven't found this collective will yet. And as individuals, I think there's this sense of disempowerment that we each feel. It's like everybody's waiting for everybody to do it together, and then we'll all do it. But if I do it by myself, it's not going to make any difference. I think there's this, this sort of deep sense of that that I know that I feel and, and a lot of other people feel too. And uh, it's something that, that it, it's an issue that I'm interested in. It's like I don't want to really have an opinion about it. It's, it's extremely complex, and it's a, I think it's a battle that each one of us has to, has to uh, or a, a conversation that each one of us has to have internally. And, uh, and so that's one of the things I try to raise with these images is when you stand back at a distance, you see the collective. You know, see this mass of something. And when you walk up close, then you see that the collective is made up of lots and lots of individuals. And it can be read in, in one of two ways. You know, you can see each individual. You can say each individual in this picture matters. And if you took one out, it would leave an empty space. And so every individual counts. But at the same time, if you threw one more cell phone in that pile, you'd never notice the difference. You know, so there's a, there are kind of two different responses that you could have to this work. Is, is one is to feel empowered, and the other one is to feel overwhelmed and, and disempowered. And uh, I think that's kind of the way our world is right now, and I'm just trying to raise this issue. I went to the University of Washington recycling department near where I live, and uh, they were kind enough to fill my car up with sticky, stinky, used plastic bottles. And uh, I came back and dumped them all in my driveway and, uh, and spent three weeks photographing them over and over and stirring them with a rake in between. And uh, I would take out a few bottles and take a picture and then I'd add a few bottles back and stir them around and take another picture and, uh, until I had hundreds of photographs of the same bottles and uh, finally had enough photographs that I could begin stitching them all together into a gigantic image of two million plastic bottles. This is five minutes of our plastic bottle consumption in the United States. And uh, by my hope with this one is when you stand back at a distance, it, uh, it has kind of the feeling of looking out over, a, over an ocean. A lot of these, a lot of these bottles are ending up in the, in the Pacific these days. And uh, if we have time at the end, um, I, uh, I don't know if we'll have time, but um, I, I recently came back from Midway Island in the Pacific uh, photographing the, the Pacific garbage patch in, in a place, in one place where it, it uh, surfaces in a particularly uh, frightening and, and symbolic way. Um, but it's really interesting, you know, to me, to step back and look at our, uh, the cumulative effect of one unconscious habit that we've gotten into as a culture. Because that's what these things are, you know, the consumption of plastic bottles or the, the, uh, the, the, the buying and throwing away of, of cell phones or the, the, the way we waste paper or the way we waste gasoline or the way we take transcontinental jet flights uh, w without really thinking. It's like these are all these unconscious behaviors that we've kind of got, these habits that we've gotten into as a culture. And, uh, and particularly the, the consumption of plastic bottles is just, it's such a bizarre one. Because just a few years ago, everybody was hydrated. You know, we were doing OK. And we weren't drinking water out of plastic bottles. And just in the last, whatever it is, in the last 20 years or something like that, since the invention of Perrier, Perrier started it all. And then it just kind of exploded from there. But before, before that, uh, or, or since that has happened, we've gotten into this, this, th this giant infrastructure of shipping millions of gallons of water around. You know, you can go to a 7-Eleven in Ohio and find water from Fiji, Australia, Switzerland, Poland, from all over the world. And there's this gigantic infrastructure of container ships filled with water traveling all around the world and ending up at our ports where the water is put onto trucks and trains and shipped all over our country. And it's the strangest thing because at the same time as we're doing that, there are 1.2 billion people in the world who lack access to safe drinking water. It's the leading cause of death on Earth right now, is, is dehydration and diarrhea and waterborne disease caused by lack of access to safe drinking water. And I've been to a lot of conferences and talked to, uh, 
you know, a lot of visionary people who are kind of looking at the world's biggest problems, and I ask them, what's the biggest problem in the world? Every single time, that's what I hear. Lack of access to safe drinking water for 1.2 billion people. And isn't it weird that, uh, that we have this phenomenon going on? It's like when we, do, when, we, when we consume on an individual basis, you know, if we go buy a, uh, a, a bottle of water or go drink a, a, a soda out of an aluminum can or buy a new cell phone, it doesn't look all that bad. You know, you can upgrade your iPod to the new iPod and the, the sea level doesn't rise three feet. You know, it's like it doesn't seem to make a difference. It's only when hundreds of millions of people are engaging in these, these, uh, these kind of behaviors that it adds up to something catastrophic that nobody wants and that nobody intends. And the problem is, as we try to relate to these issues, as we try to find our place in this massive collective and try to relate to these cumulative effects that we're having on the environment and on our culture, the only information we have to relate to these mass phenomenon is these gigantic numbers because there's nowhere we can go and see it. Like there's nowhere, to, there's nowhere you can go and experience with your senses the 20,600,000 barrels of oil that we burn in the United States every single day. America is the world's leading consumer of, of petroleum, 20,600,000 barrels. The number two consumer of oil in the world is China. They burn a little more than 7 million barrels of oil a day. So it's, it's vastly disproportionate here. And if we could stand in front of 20,600,000 barrels, I think it would, be, it would be incredibly shocking. Every barrel is 42 gallons. It's those metal drums that, that you've all seen. And I, I was trying to figure out how to, how to show 20,600,000 barrels of oil. And uh, I, I ran the numbers to figure out if you just made an unbroken line of oil drums, how long, how long of a line would it be to, uh, to add up to 20,600,000? And it's, it's a, an unbroken line of 42-gallon drums more than 6,000 miles long from Los Angeles to London, um, a quarter of the way around the world. And uh, I tried to do a piece about it where every oil barrel was going to be an eighth of an inch tall. And uh, so you have to walk way up close to the print to even see what it is you're looking at. And uh, I can't remember what the numbers were, but it was if I made the print five feet tall with each oil drum an eighth of an inch in size, then it w the, the, the print would have to be something like 450 miles long. It was, it was far beyond what I, I, could, I could depict. And uh, it's, it's so bizarre to, to stand back and to, to be able to see the, you know, the, the, the enormity of our mass consumption. And this is really what I'm trying to do, is to take these, these numbers, these incomprehensible numbers in the millions and the billions and, and the hundreds of billions, and to translate them out of that, that, uh, ink, that the, the dry, unfeeling language of huge numbers and lots of zeros into a visual language that might allow for us to relate to these, uh, these phenomena more. Because my own belief is we don't act until we feel something. I think that's the sort of missing link right now in American culture, is we know what we need to do Al Gore says we don't have the political will to do it. I think we don't have the feeling yet. We just haven't gotten angry enough. We just haven't gotten sad enough at what's being lost. Or we haven't gotten frightened enough. And there's this kind of anesthesia, I think, that has crept into American culture. You know, we, we used to get a lot angrier than we do now. And uh, I think there used to be more feeling. I think it may be fair to say that American culture is, is the, or the American people are the people who are now the most distant from their feelings of any culture in the world. And there may be other countries that are up there with us, but I think it's a, it's a deep cultural crisis that we're in. We become distant from, from what we feel. And I don't think it's because we're bad people. I don't think it's because we're unfeeling. I think in large part it's because of the nature of the information that is coming into us. How can you really care about something when it's only depicted as a gigantic number? You know, 2 million plastic bottles every 5 minutes. What if I said this is 50 million bottles? We use 50 million bottles every 5 minutes. It wouldn't have any different effect than the 2 million bottles. If I told you we use 210 billion plastic bottles a year. Well, no, actually, that's wrong. We use 420 billion plastic bottles a year. No, actually, that was wrong, too. We use 840 plastic billion plastic bottles a year. It's like none of those numbers has a, a different effect on us. It's just, 
Like my experience is it doesn't go in one ear and out the other. It goes in one ear and back out the same ear. It just like doesn't even <laughs> register. And yet that's the only information we have to relate to these profoundly important phenomena that each one of us is playing a role in. Went to my local supermarket and got uh, a, a stack of 100 brown paper supermarket bags and uh, brought them back to my studio, photographed them, and then uh, restacked them into a different stack and took another photograph and spent a few tedious days doing that until I had lots and lots of pictures of brown paper supermarket bags that I could then start stacking up. And my original idea was to just make stacks and stacks and stacks until it was this giant brown kind of texture. And I tried that, and it just didn't look like much. Um, and, uh, and I had all of these stacks. Uh, each one of them was saved as a separate layer in Photoshop. And I turned them all off except one. And lo and behold, it looked like a tree. It was just long, thin column of brown paper supermarket bags. And I thought, oh, that's it. Make a, a forest, which maybe is be the, the forest that these bags came from. And uh, so I spent a few weeks building this gigantic image of 1.14 million brown paper supermarket bags, which is one hour of our consumption of brown paper supermarket bags. And of course, this is just one paper product. You know, we use uh, similar quantities. There's a, there's a similar scale associated with our use of office paper and, and uh, newspaper and the paper for junk mail and paper for packaging and cardboard and so on. When you start all adding all that stuff up, it, it begins to become kind of clear why our forests are being destroyed. One of my pet peeves is the amount of waste that happens on airline flights, and uh, particularly plastic cups. There's, a, there's apparently a regulation that says that they are not allowed to refill a plastic cup because of uh, sanity. What, What's the word? San sanity. Sanity. <laughs> for sanity reason. For <laughs> sanitation. There's another word for it. I can't think of what the word is. Uh, anyway, um, because hygiene, that was it. Yeah. Um, because, uh, you know, a, a cold germ might jump from the lip of the cup to the lip of the bottle and transfer to somebody. But I think it's just really smart lobbying by the plastic cup companies. Because every time they give you another drink on a plane, if you're on a, you know, a multi-hour flight, they, they use multiple cups to give you multiple drinks. And uh, the result is this incredible amount of waste of plastic cups on airline flights. So uh, I brought home a, a plastic cup from uh, an airline flight and photographed it, and then just trimmed off the lip of the cup and then just pasted it on top and did that 100 times until I had what looked like a stack of cups. And then, uh, and then I bent it in all different directions in, in Photoshop and used that to uh, start building an image of, of a kind of chemical plant. And after several long weeks of that, I had an image that, uh, that was one million plastic cups. This is the number of plastic cups used just on airline flights in the United States every six hours. So it takes four of this image to show one day of our plastic cup consumption just on airline flights. What this one hopefully looks like when you stand back at a distance is uh, a, a neo-Gothic cartoon drawing of a factory spewing out pollution. But uh, a friend of mine looked at it and said, no, that's what the LA freeway system's going to look like in another couple hundred years. <laughs> it's like the freeway interchange from hell. And uh, you know, every time I show this image, I, I get this little um, tweak uh, of shame in my stomach, because I talk about the amount of, uh, of waste that there is on airlines in plastic cups. But uh, you know, I fly all over the world on airline flights, and I don't use plastic cups anymore. But of course, the environmental footprint of the CO2 coming out of the back of the jet is way worse than the plastic cups. And uh, I looked at my own carbon footprint a while back, and it's, it's atrocious. And uh, it made me, one of the things it made me realize is I'm really in no position to wag my finger at anybody. I had an attitude about SUVs for a while because I drive a small car. You know, and I, I realize I have this tendency, like if there's one thing that I'm doing that's good, well then I wag my finger at all the people that are doing bad just on that particular issue. But the truth is when I stand back and look at the amount that I consume kind of on the aggregate, I think I'm, I'm probably in the worst tiny little percent of consumers because of the amount of jet flying that I do. That's one of the most en environmentally destructive things that, that people do is fly jets. Eat meat and fly jets. Those are the two uh, most environmentally harmful things that, uh, that, that most of us do. Um, 
And uh, so I had, I had an attitude about SUVs for a while um, because I drive this little car. And uh, so I wanted to do a piece about the, the GMC Denali. Um, and uh, so I pretended I was interested in buying one. I went to a dealer and told them I wanted to buy one for my wife. And would they mind if I photographed a couple to show the colors? <laughs> and uh, so that got me in there to take the photograph of the Denali logo on the door. So I, I did a white one and, and uh, several different gray ones and a black one. And uh, sometime during that process, this little pun occurred to me. So I, I changed the, round, the, the, <laughs> the, the letters around a little bit. And uh, I made a 10-step grayscale from white to black of, uh, of Denali and Denial logos and uh, in honor of Ansel Adams' zone system. And, uh, and then I used all of these Denali Denial images, 24,000 of them, to build a gigantic image of the real Denali. And uh, this is Ansel Adams' famous photograph of Mount McKinley in Denali National Park, made of 24,000 GMC Denali logos, which was six weeks of Denali sales back when uh, SUVs were at their peak in 2004. And uh, I, I, as I said, I used to have an attitude about SUVs and, and particularly about Hummers. You know, I did a piece about Hummers. And, uh, and it didn't take me long to realize, that once I started looking at my own environmental footprint, that, uh, that my carbon footprint is probably far worse than most of the people who drive Hummers. And, uh, and so I realized I'm, I'm, I'm really in no position to, to, to wag my finger at anybody. And if you could come to my studio, you'd see this gigantic printer that makes these pieces. It's, this, uh, it's, about, it's almost six feet wide, and it's probably the equivalent of 500 new cell phones worth of electronics. And so who am I to wag my finger at somebody who upgrades their cell phone or you know, who gets a new iPod? It's like I, I realize I'm truly not in a position to preach at anybody. I'm, I'm right in there as, as, uh, as an American consumer. And at the same time, I want to say something. You know, I kind of, like I have this, a metaphor that I carry with me is that I, I kind of feel like an alcoholic who's woken up to my alcoholism. And now I'm sitting at the dinner table with my family who are metaphorically, who are all al alcoholics. And I'm saying, you guys, look at the giant pile of empty vodka bottles over there in the corner. You know, and uh, fill my glass up while we discuss this, but we got to talk about it. <laughs> it's hard. You know, I think it's kind of a, a, a dilemma that we all face right now. It's like as we wake up to these issues, as we wake up, uh, uh, you know, as in, in this generation, um, we're waking up for the first time to, uh, to the, the destructive effect that our behaviors are having. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? You know, we want to be ethical people. And at the same time, we don't want to give up this lifestyle that we've created for ourselves and that's been handed to us by the previous generation. It's like, how do we be an ethical person uh, now that we know what we know? It's, uh, I think it's one of the central dilemmas of our times. So I, I have only five minutes left, so I'm going to burn through a few more. Um, this is uh, the famous Surratt painting that was done in the pointillist style. And I decided I wanted to make a pointillist image. Instead of little dots of paint, it was going to be uh, lots of aluminum cans. This is 106,000 aluminum cans, which is 30 seconds of our aluminum can consumption in the US. And uh, one of the things I, I always say when I, I talk about this work is that uh, I received an email from a member of the aluminum can recycling industry asking me, whenever I show this work, please remind the audience that 50% of the cans in the United States are recycled. So I think that's, that's a good thing to do. 50% of the aluminum cans we use in the United States are not recycled. <laughs> and it's an incredible <laughs> waste of aluminum. I've heard that just the aluminum cans that we throw in the garbage is equal to the amount of aluminum it would take to completely rebuild our entire fleet of commercial jetliners, which is uh, you know, whatever it is, 11,000 747s and Airbuses and all, and all those planes. That's the amount of aluminum we waste. And extracting aluminum from, from, uh, from the earth uh, is, is extremely environmentally destructive and takes an enormous amount of power to get it from underneath the Brazilian rainforest, where it comes from, all the way to be an aluminum can in a supermarket uh, you know, in, in New York. There's an enormous environmental impact involved in that. So I realized after a while that I could apply this, this visualization technique to social issues as well as, as uh, mass consumption. And uh, 
for, as mass consumption sort of appeared for my eyes, it was like a, a kind of waking up from the matrix experience to discover the, the, you know, the, the mass consumption. And I thought that was the biggest issue for a while. And uh, in, in a way, it still is the biggest issue. And, and uh, there are also other issues that are uh, profoundly important um, that sort of are these invisible mass issues that affect our culture. And so uh, I decided I wanted to start depicting some of those. So here's uh, an image of prison uniforms. I wanted to show the number of Americans in prison. America has the largest prison population of any country on Earth. Measured both in terms of the absolute number. There's no other country that has 2.3 million people in jail. And more frightening to me is the fact that America has the largest percentage of its population incarcerated of any country on Earth. That includes all the countries we like to wag our fingers at as being the evil dictatorships that are the enemies of freedom. There is no other country that has a larger percentage of its population incarcerated. In fact, one out of four prisoners on Earth are Americans in jail in America. So uh, I wanted to show 2.3 million of something, so I went and got these prison uniforms and made an image. Uh, and uh, the way I made this one is I wanted the prison uniforms to be as small as they could possibly be and still be visible. So they're a sixteenth of an inch tall, the thickness of a dime on its edge when you walk up to the print. So you have to literally get all the way up where your nose is almost on the print to be able to see what it is you're looking at. And then I did the math to figure out if they're that small in the print, uh, how big does the print have to be to, to show 2.3 million? And it turned out to be 10 by 25 feet in size. And there it is installed in a gallery in New York a couple years ago. Another tragedy that I wanted to depict that uh, I won't have time to talk about, but maybe, we'll, maybe you can, we can hit it in question and answer, is uh, breast augmentation, elective breast augmentation surgery, which is an epidemic that is spreading across the, uh, the, the culture of our young women in the United States. 384,000 women last year in the United States went and got elective breast augmentation, and the vast majority of those are under the age of 21. It's become the most popular high school graduation gift in several states now, being given by families to their daughters who are about to go away to college. So the Barbie doll, of course, is an iconic example of the objectification of the female body, which is, to me is the root cause of this uh, tragic kind of epidemic. And so I used the Barbie doll to build a gigantic image of 32,000 Barbies, which is equal to the number of, of women who go in every month uh, to have their breasts enhanced surgically. Here's the last one I'll show you. Um, I went and got one black dog collar and photographed it in lots of different configurations and then started pasting it. And then I got one white cat flea collar and photographed it in lots of different configurations and, and made this big white background. Um, and uh, it's an image to show the number of unwanted dogs and cats that are euthanized in the United States. And uh, the number, the, the last number, the number that I used for this is 10,000 a day. Um, and uh, I showed this just a couple days ago. Uh, to a group, and this woman came up and she said, you know, it's changed more recently because the economy's gone down, people can't afford to spay and neuter their pets, and they're giving away their pets as they lose their homes, move into apartments, so the number's up much closer to 20,000 a day now. Um, so uh, here's the actual number of unwanted dogs and cats that are euthanized in the United States every day. And, uh, oh yeah, this is the last piece I'm gonna show. Um, I just finished this one recently. This, is, uh, this piece is called Year of the Tiger. And uh, it's a piece that shows that the, the actual number of tigers left on Earth. There are 3,200 tigers left. That includes all the tigers in the wild and all the tigers in zoos, all species of tigers. 3,200 tigers left uh, on the planet. And uh, so I made this image. It's the, the actual image is just about the size you see it there on the screen. And uh, when you go up, when you walk up close, you see that it's lots of, of little stuffed animal tigers that were made by a, a women's cooperative in Cambodia. Um, and, uh, and the space in between, at the same scale, if you filled up the space in between with the same tigers, it would, it would hold 40,000 tigers. And that was the global po uh, tiger population in 1970. We're losing our tigers really fast. And uh, there are advocacy groups out there fighting on behalf of the tigers, but they're uh, it, it looks like uh, the tigers are going to be gone within uh, probably a decade. We'll have no tigers left. And uh, we lost the northern white rhino just uh, a few months ago. You may have heard. The last northern white rhino on Earth died in a zoo. And they're not, they're not, prop they're not uh, reproducing in zoos. Um, and, uh, you know, part of, part of why I do this work and, and, and what I'm really interested in is, is to allow ourselves to feel these things. 
You know, the loss of our, our charismatic megafauna, you know, the, the decline of our orcas and our dolphins and whales and elephants and so on, and, and the, the fact that we're in the largest extinction of species in the history of the world right now, it's incredibly sad. It's a tragedy that's equal, in my own view, to losing a loved one. And, and there's very little grieving. There's very little actual mourning going on. There's very little feeling around it. It's just kind of like more like a wow that uh, we get when we read these giant numbers. And I think if we could allow ourselves to feel these things, feel whatever we feel, whether it's anger or grief or rage or fear, if we could really allow ourselves to feel these things and be with the anxiety that comes from having these hard feelings and share those feelings with each other in community, then that might kind of clear the way for the, the kind of the, the passionate action that we all know that we all need to take. So I think I'll end there. Um, I ask that you not applaud. Um, applause is like letting go of the balloons. And if there's, if there's any balloon that you've grabbed a hold of during this, then just hold on to it. Um, and uh, there's my website if you're interested in seeing any more of my work. I open source my work for anyone who wants to use it for any non-commercial purpose. And uh, I think we might have some time for questions now. Yeah, we have uh, two microphones over here, so one over there, one right here. If you wouldn't mind just coming up to the microphone, say your name, and get right to your question so we can get to as many people as, uh, as possible. And by the way, um, I'm, in, I'm most interested in hard questions. You know, if you have a question that you think might be offensive to me or that might be uncomfortable um, or that points out an irony or hypocrisy or whatever, I'm, please bring those because uh, I'm here to talk about the, the hard issues and that's what I want to get to, so. Yeah, come right up. A great talk. Uh, so I, uh, a recent, two things that happened recently in the news is the Copenhagen climate crisis yeah. and then Haiti. Copenhagen was in December and then Haiti happened in early January, so a month apart. And from my perspective, everyone I knew in the United States, Facebook, et cetera, no one mentioned Copenhagen. It never came up in conversation. It never came up on Facebook. And then Haiti happened, and everyone's talking about Haiti. And we're talking about uh, one, closer to the sure, one event is affects you know, a terrible event in Haiti, and we can see it on the news. But Copenhagen, which has implications that are going to, for the survival of our planet, it speaks to, I think, your numbers theory of no one can get their head around that. Mm. And there isn't a face to that. So I wonder if you put those two together. To me, it was disturbing that like, everyone's saying, sending $10 to Haiti when I think they should be sending $10 mm. to unelect, you know, get rid of the politicians that are maintaining yeah. the system that we have. So. Yeah, really interesting observation. Yeah, you know, there's something personal about Haiti. You know, we saw photographs of individual people who were suffering. and. Uh, and, and Copenhagen is this kind of abstract concept. And uh, at the same time, I think we haven't we all kind of gotten used to the fact that our government doesn't work? And now when our government doesn't work, like we don't even respond anymore. I noticed that for the last uh, nine years. Um, and uh, it's, it, it, it's so sad. And you know, if, if you, there, there's this series of events that have happened uh, recently. There's the, 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 the Copenhagen process was a circus, and now uh, our government is just in, our federal government is in total gridlock. You know, I, I thought when uh, Obama came, to, came into office that they were going to pass health care like the first morning, you know, and just like be done with that one and on to the next thing. And uh, we're, our government is in total gridlock, at, right at the very moment when we need the most passionate action. And, uh, and I, Ariana Huffington the other day in the Huffington Post wrote uh, what I thought was a really courageous posting where she said, uh, the big hope, in all caps, you know, the big hope we've all been talking about, we've all been waiting for, the big hope is a bust. And, uh, and she said, we need hope 2.0. And no one knows what that looks like yet. But uh, I, I have the feeling that American culture is sliding into an, a, a period of unprecedented despair and hopelessness right now. There's, there's this feeling like, what else is there left to do? We've tried everything. And at the same time, culturally, as, that, as that's coming in, you know, there are millions of people who are out there doing this really passionate work. And uh, it's just, it's a fascinating time to, to, to be a part of right now. But, but my fear is, if we don't face this dark side, if we, if we only look at, uh, continue to go for hope, you know, this kind of empty idea that's been out there all this time, hope, whatever that is, it's this, thing that's in the future, 
You know, it's like the pursuit of happiness. It's like, am I ever going to get there? You know, the hope is this, this thing that lies out in the future that, this, that really ends up being kind of empty when you get to it. I think if, if we don't allow ourselves to go to the other side of that, to look at the despair we feel right now, look at the hopelessness, experience our, the feeling of disempowerment, like acknowledge that stuff. It's going to be there whether we acknowledge it or not. And if we acknowledge it, then at least it's on the table. It's not going to be manifesting unconsciously as depression and uh, you know, drug abuse and denial and so on. Bring it on the table and share it in community with each other. I think that, ha that has transformational power to our culture. Next. Yeah. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm in Wagner for Urban Planning. Um, I wonder if you could put up like the water bottle slide like a question box. Um, yeah. um, and I, if, if you could do that, I'm, you're, you're, I'm adding you to the, to the list of people I'm glad didn't kill themselves. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, so I wanted to um, talk just about another guy who didn't kill himself, Bucky Fuller. He talked about mm. his contemplation of suicide a lot. And he said pollution is nothing but the resources we're not harvesting. We allow them to disperse because we've been ignorant of their value. Um, but when I see a picture like this, it, it kind of speaks to the paradox uh, that you were bringing up. I, I think a paradox of, of what you're trying to accomplish here, because um, I, I see this and I think, you know, I would have to zoom so far in or out to, to figure out where I fit in to that. And so I'm glad that you're open sourcing this because I would challenge you or maybe other people in this room or that you work with to make illustrations that that show what one person's consumption is and maybe even make it interactive so that if you pulled out 17 paper bags a, a tree would reappear something, something along those lines wow. yeah you know when i when i look at this work objectively it seems it's so inadequate to actually convey what I, what I really feel about these issues. And uh, there's so many other really cool, brilliant ways that, uh, that this, these issues could be hit. And, uh, and I just, I wish, I wish more artists would start doing stuff exactly like you just mentioned. And, and there are lots of artists that are doing really cool work that way. There's one, uh, there's one I think it's a couple, who's gone around the world photographing the amount of food people eat. Um, you guys have probably seen that, where you know it's a, a uh, an African family, and it's like just these little handfuls of rice and flour is, is their entire week's food, and then you know it's an American family, this huge array of Cheerios and Snickers, and so like this unbelievable amount of stuff in one week's worth of food. Anyway, yeah, thanks, Daniel, for your for your good comment. Uh, hi, I'm Ilsan. I'm um, with Gallatin and also the Reynolds program. Um, so I want to thank you for your presentation and also sharing your personal story. Um, and my question is. So you talked about um, part of the problem or the inability to comprehend large numbers as part of the reason why we don't address our own consumerism. But I wanted to ask you what you see as the root cause of mass consumption. And um, the second part of the question is, um, what is the intended impact that, you're, that you want your work to have mm. in that root cause? Cool. Um, I want to answer both of those and remind me what the second one is because I'll probably forget <laughs> by the time I get to the end of the first one. So the root cause of mass consumption, that's a really interesting question. I'm always like trying to make it all the way down to the, you know, the, the root causes of things. And one of the things I believe, and this, this may be controversial and, and some people may get angry, but this is just my own belief. I believe that the existence of the corporation is one of the great scourges of, 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 of the world right now. And it's not the people that work in them, it's the corporation itself. It's this legal entity that got created. And I can't remember when they first allowed the existence of the corporation. But the corporation is it's given legal status as a person. And that personhood of corporations is the thing that has led to so much of, of, uh, of, of the problems of the world right now. And corporate personhood just got much stronger by a new Supreme Court decision that allows them to give as much money as they want to. Uh, to political campaigns. And there are activist organizations out there that are trying to get the laws changed to, to allow corporations to not be persons anymore. Um, and, uh, and those people believe that it would have a transformational effect on our society. Um, but the, the, the problem is 
the other side of that lawsuit is corporations, and all of them. You know, the oil companies, the coal companies, the chemical companies, the pharmaceutical companies are all, uh, th there's this tremendous political and financial power behind them uh, battling these little organizations that want to take away corporate personhood. But uh, it's interesting, it's, I don't know, when you, when you go down to those root causes, it sort of has this tendency to swirl around and come back out the other side. You know, you could say it's, it's just our human, human foibles, you know, greed, um, fear, uh, is what runs our mass consumption, or, or maybe marketing, you know? Cap capitalism, the concept of capitalism. Yeah, the existence of money. What if there was no money? What if we just gave, you know, what if everybody just gave what, what, they, what they had? Uh, it's, it's hard to trace to, but uh, it's, it's a really interesting exercise. And then, oh yeah, impact. Um, I was recently given this, this interesting uh, kind of analytical model for, for, for impacting others. Um, and I'll pass it along to you because I think it, it has some value. Um, it is, uh, if you try to influence the way people behave, then you're an activist. Well, if you can influence the way people think, then that automatically might influence the way they behave. And in that case, you're an advocate. Well, if you can influence the way people feel, then that'll automatically influence the way they think and the way they behave. And in that case, you're an artist. And if you can influence, if you can fundamentally change people's consciousness and, uh, uh, and, and enhance self-awareness, then I can't remember what the name of that was, but the person who described it to me said that's like just Jesus and Gandhi and the Buddha. <laughs> but I don't believe that. I think there are tons of people out there who are having a, 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 a transformational effect on people's consciousness. And if you think of the best movies you've seen, you know, Avatar had that effect on me. You know, I hated the like white hero <coughs> aspect of Avatar, but just the visuals and the, the connection with nature and there's a kind of sacred aspect to Avatar that that had that effect. There are lots of movies that have that effect. And music, you know, really great music to me. Um, to, to go and uh, hear a, a, an African group uh, singing in their beautiful, soft, uh, you know, the, the way that Africans sing. Um, I heard a group from uh, Rwanda recently who'd been through the genocide. These are people whose families had, had been murdered in front of them, and they were singing just in this incredibly beautiful way that had that effect on me. And so that's the level I'm, the, the sort of my own North Star. And I, I, you know, mostly people tell me I'm not drinking water out of plastic bottles anymore after I saw your work, which means I'm just hitting the very bottom level of affecting behavior. But, the, you know, I'm, that's, that's sort of the North Star that I point my work at. And I think every now and then there's a visual artist who, who has that effect. Picasso had that effect. And uh, I know I'm no Picasso, but at least it's a good, it's a good star to orient the compass to. Uh, hi, my name is Misha. I'm with the Wagner School of Public Service. Um, your talk made me think of, of three people. Um, Woody Tash, who was another Reynolds speaker and who also spoke of the power of numbers and of our inability to understand them. Andy Goldsworthy, um, whose art, um, especially with that the swirling of the cell phones, when he started arranging nature, it almost made me recognize this trash and crap as, as, as nature, in the same way that he starts arranging nature to bring out more beauty and more depth in what's already what's already out there. And the and the third one, um, which I thought was more interesting, was Robert Piercig, because you were talking about consumption. Piercig wrote um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, oh. so was very influential on the idea of consumption, um, and certainly on my formation, my ideas of consumption. Um, and he's talked a lot about, I guess, you could simplify this morality of quality, uh, of, of 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 seeing something well made, something not disposable. Um, and recognizing that as an objective good. Hmm. Um, and so when you talked about consumption, I actually, in your speech, I found it uh, jarringly overgeneralized. The idea of consumption isn't that finite a concept. There's, there's a lot of levels of consumption, and really what it strikes me is you're not just talking about mass consumption or, or good consumption on a large scale. You're talking about planned obsolescence. You're talking about crap. You're talking about disposable, wasteful yeah. crap. You're not talking about us doing stuff. You know, it's not, a, it's not about cups, it's not about how many cups you have, it's about how many cups you throw away, or how many cell phones you throw away, just because they're badly made, because they're, plan they're, they're created to be thrown away. And I mean, if you wanted to really trace it back to root causes, then that might be something. Anyway, I wanted to ask you about that. Where have you, where have you come across the idea of, of responsible consumption? You know, of the idea of, 
of living surrounded by quality as opposed to surrounded by crap? Mm, yeah, really, uh, really good question. Thank you for making that distinction. Because I do tend to overgeneralize and say that all consumption is bad. And, and of course, uh, you know, tons of the products that we have and that we use are incredibly beneficial. You know, and, and uh, medical supplies are, are one of those. You know, I wouldn't want us to not consume the plastic that, that, uh, is, that goes into the creation of an MRI machine and save millions of people's lives or whatever. And uh, it's hard because the, when I use the word consumption, what I'm, meaning about, what, what I'm meaning is not necessarily the creation of good quality products that we use. It's the, uh, I don't know of another word for it. It's, it's like when you extract a resource from the ground and use it in a way that it then it, it's used up. You know, we're consuming oil. Um, but, but, and, and the problem is, like imagine for a moment, let's do, the, let's do a, a little mental exercise. Imagine for a moment that we're not a bunch of people sitting at NYU uh, in Manhattan. We're the Galactic Council. <laughs> and we're sitting on planet Zork, 25,000 light years from Earth. And our, our society has been around for a few billion years. You know, which means that we, we, we're all living in an enlightened way and, and we know in our society that we can't consume a single resource because it all has to come back and be used over and over and over again billions of times. And that every single molecule on our planet is incredibly valuable. And so here we are, the Galactic Council, we've been watching the Earth through our high power telescope for a few thousand years. And uh, in the last 25 or 50 years, we've started to see a really alarming trend. We're wondering, have they gotten it yet? Like, have they gotten that they live on this little tiny speck? And if they want to survive, if they want to make it off their planet by the time their sun is, uh, is, expires and make it out and survive for billions of years, if they want to kind of live up to their, the mandate that they have, which is to, is to perpetuate then they're going to have to do something really different with the resources that they have than they're doing now. And it's such an interesting question, you know, because we can't go back to, to all living like cave people again. And, you know, we, we couldn't do that, and no one wants to. We have to consume somehow, and there are all these products that we have that are valuable, and the idea of living with quality stuff is, is it's a beautiful idea. The question is, like, how are we going to get from where we are now into a future where things really do go round and round and round and round and round because there's only a certain amount of oil and there's only a certain amount of aluminum and there's only a certain amount of, of, uh, of, of any resource that we have. And when we consume these resources, we're, it's like I think it was Bucky Fuller that said, we have to live off the interest. We can't live off the principle. And we're, we're living off the principle right now. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's an impossible question. You know, it's, uh, it's more of a, I think it's a really good question to hold and to talk about because there is no answer to it yet. Hi, I'm Karen Phillips and I work for Free Dimensional, which is an international network of artists and activists. I'm also mm. a student at Wagner. Um, a couple of the pictures that you showed uh, really brought up the idea for me that a lot of the consumption is, is systemic. And there's policies in place that keep it going at a certain level, like you mentioned the airlines. So I'm curious about if you've seen your work being linked to specific policy changes. And also, if so, what, what kind of reactions do you get from people in power, people who are actually able to be making some of these bigger decisions about how resources are consumed? Well, the, uh, the, the only effect that I know that my work has had sort of on a, on a policy level is uh, there, there have been several measures passed uh, about plastic bags um, that uh, I've been told that, that you know, these people were, were aware of or inspired by my work or whatever. Um, because uh, I did a piece about plastic bags a while back and it was, a, it was an image that sort of looked like this. It was 60,000 plastic bags, which was five seconds of our consumption of plastic bags, sacks, and wraps in the United States. And uh, I've the, I can't remember where this was. Um, it seems like it was in the deep, is uh, North Carolina or South Carolina. There's a senator from from one of those places that uh, that used that piece in an, in an argument uh, in their state legislature about eliminating plastic bags. And uh, Whole Foods, when Whole Foods eliminated plastic bags, I, I got a letter from the CEO saying it was my piece that inspired him to to uh, eliminate plastic bags from the whole Whole Foods company. 
Um, so that was really exciting. But it's really hard because I think there's a lot of lip service that goes on in our government. You know, some say, I'm inspired by your, you know, your passionate talk about this or that. But what they're, what they're really doing is just kind of like putting us off and, and because they're being influenced by companies like Monsanto. And uh, until we can break that chain and make our political process actually accountable to us again, us being the people, you know, can you imagine if we had politicians who are in office who are thinking about, like, what's the best thing I can do for the country? You know, or in, instead of what's the best thing I can do for the five giant corporations that, uh, that live in my state? You know, then I think this, the, you know, the, the policy changes could happen really fast. And until that happens, I, it, it's hard to see them happening at all. Hi, my name is Anurag Gupta, and I'm at, I'm at the law school, actually, also part of the Reynolds program. So, um, my question basically is more personal than anything else because whenever I come to these kind of uh, presentations, I'm always struck. Of course, I'm moved, and I'm like very thankful for you to like actually show us the numbers of in like various forms of our everyday living and the catastrophe that it is. But as a socially responsible consumer who um, tries as much as he can to consume, um, you know, just consume properly and to cons uh, consume not to waste. Um, these kind of presentations just, um, I guess, they alienate me a little bit because whenever we talk about this we, that this is what we are doing, I'm like, I'm not one of those we. Mm. I am not that we. And people in my community are not part of those we because I come from an inner city school. I, I went to an inner city school, went to, you know, like a, a poor neighborhood. We're not part of this we. Why do I have to attach myself to this and feel obligated that, you know, I'm doing this on a regular basis? So, like, just like you said that you like to look at the macro picture and then go into the micros, when you talk about the corporation, yes, as, as it exists today, it's an awful institution, but who are those corporations controlled by? Who are the shareholders? Who are the board members? And do they represent me? Do they represent my communities? Do they represent my interests, right? So, like, and that's when I, like, be begin to, like, feel alienated that, well, on the one hand, you're preaching to the choir, because I'm totally with you on your message and everything you're saying. But on the other hand, I don't know what to do, because, you know, a huge portion of the discussion is just completely left out, which is that when we discuss power, we discuss who's in power and who's controlling these agendas. I have no impact on it as a person of color in this country, as a person, uh, you know, like who doesn't have as much voice as people that do have voice, uh, voices. So, I mean, I think that's something either I would recommend you also incorporate, like when you mentioned that prison population example. I mean, it's a wonderful way of how racist our regime has been. I mean, come 1970, which was right after the Civil Rights Act, we had less than 100,000 people in jails in the U.S., less than 100,000. Now it's 2.3 million, you know, within. And who are those people? Mostly African Americans and Latinos, you know, 60% of them. So, I mean, that's something that we are unwilling to get our mind around because we just don't want to talk about it. We're in this post-racial era, now that we have a black president. But look, look at who's giving him trouble. Who's giving him trouble in Congress? So, I mean, I just think that it's great that you're doing this and it's amazing, but again, we need to kind of bridge the connection and kind of incorporate other mechanisms and realities of the ground within it. Thank you. Mm. Well, wow, really beautifully and passionately said. Thank you. Um, you know, there's only, there's only one comment I want to make in, in response. Um, and that is, uh, I, I hesitate to do the thing of saying I'm not involved in, in, in the kind of uh, polarization that can happen. Because um, if, if you think about, uh, like, there's, I, I could give you a whole list of stuff that I do that makes me not part of the we as well. And, you know, I, I bet there are quite a few people in here who've, who've taken steps in their own life, you know, to become a more ethical consumer. Um, and uh, the thing is, I hesitate to even go there because, first of all, I don't want to get into a us versus them um, kind of mentality. And the other thing is, whatever I do, and I think whatever anyone is doing in our country right now, to not be, to, to kind of step out of consumer culture, it's not enough. None of it is enough. And so if you think about, um, so wait, where, where are you? There you are, back there. If, uh, I, I know you, you can think about all the things that you do, but also think about the fact that you're right now in this room availing yourselves, yourself, of the microphone that you just spoke through and the, the, the electricity that, uh, that is, I don't know where New York's electricity comes from, but I'll bet you it's coal-powered. And, uh, you know, like, 
rather than thinking of yourself as not being the we, do the mental exercise to think of how much you are part of this we. And I know it's kind of overwhelming and, and frightening and frustrating because we want to have the, the power to do something about it. You know, and I totally get your, your sense of not having a voice. I think, I think a, a huge number of Americans have that, that experience right now. And, and even if you use your voice, the government doesn't care to hear it. You know, there's this, uh, there's this weird experience of people going out and marching, and, and it just it seems to have no effect on our government anymore. But uh, yeah, your points are well taken, and thank you. Uh, thanks for your passion. Hi, I'm Michaela. I'm from the Wagner School as well. And I, my question is actually um, directly related almost to the previous point that you just made. Um, I really resonated to when you said, I experience that I don't matter. When you're talking about, you know, should I bother to recycle? Should I bother to turn off my lights? Um, it used to be one of the things, one of the very few things that my ex boyfriend and I used to argue about because I think recycling mm -hmm. is really important. Um, but so my question is, you know, I think you're kind of right. There is this kind of anesthesia that's kind of crept into our culture and this, this sense of how can one person really make a difference. Um, but uh, I don't, you know, I'm wondering what are your thoughts on how do you change that experience? How do you help us or how do we figure out how to make ourselves experience that we do matter yeah. on a daily basis? Yeah. Well, that's the big question. Um, and uh, the, the metaphor that I like to carry is uh, like looking at root causes. Um, I, think, I think one of the root causes of our cultural problems right now is the sense that most of us have that we don't matter. And it's like one of those core beliefs that leads to this huge number of, of behaviors. And I like to carry this idea, this, this image of a, of a gauge what has a needle that either has, I don't matter, and I do matter. And I think a huge number of, the, of Americans, including me in a large way, my needle is on, I don't matter. And with that core belief, then there's all these behaviors that flow from it. And the question is, how to flip it over to, I do matter, you know? And, uh, and I don't know what the answer is. This, is. this is what I'm trying to get to with my work. You know, I'm putting my passion into the question, but it's like the more I open the question, the more complex it gets. And uh, it's, I wish there was an easy answer, you know, I wish I could just, I had the one perfect aphorism, you know, the one piece of wisdom from Ben Franklin that, that I could hit you over the head with and you'd, and you'd have the experience of mattering. But, but my own view is it's, it's, a, it's, it's one of the, the, the central issues of our time and it's a question that each one of us has to, has to address internally. You know, I'm, uh, I'm involved in a, a documentary film project right now, and the, the, the subtitle for the, for the film project is The Battle for the Planet is Inside Us. It's not something out there. It's, it's like a battle that we have to each fight inside of ourselves. And, 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 uh, and when it's looked at that way, it, I think it, it, it's really fascinating because that's one way that we each do matter. You know, and, and if we don't have a voice that... that that affects things out there, if we don't have the ability to change things out there, the one thing that we do have the ability to do is look inward and fight this battle internally. And uh, there are a lot of spiritual practitioners who say that's the key. That what this really is going on right now, it's not a battle to save the environment. It's a, it's, it's a kind of spiritual process that each one of us has to go through. And I don't mean religious. I'm not a religious person. But it's this, it's this uh, almost kind of spiritual experience of finding our place. You know, and one over 6.7 billion does not equal zero. And if anyone here is a, a math major, you might know one over infinity doesn't equal zero. It's something. It's not nothing. And the question is how to find that, to, to sort of accept the infinitesimally small role that each one of us has in this incomprehensibly huge dynamic living system that's our biosphere accept the smallness of the role. We can't be like Bruce Willis and save the world. You know, we have this long mythology in America that each person is supposed to save the world. You know, that one man is going to, you know, one woman is going gonna, is gonna to hold the key and, and save it for us. To, to sort of accept that we live in this dynamic living system and that we each have a place. It's a really small place, but it's nevertheless a place. It's a fascinating issue to really start looking at. 
But you know, um, let me make one more comment about that. Um, here's one of my own little uh, mental kind of puzzles that I, that I wrestle with. It's this notion that if everybody else would just get their act together, you know, if, if everybody would vote for a good president, if everybody would stop eating junk food, if everybody would become a vegetarian, if everybody would stop flying, well, then I wouldn't have to. You know, I could st still keep right on being the most rampant, self-centered consumer, and the world would be healed. So in that case, I didn't play a role. I didn't matter. And if everybody doesn't get their act together, but I do, if I become this hyper-ethical person and, you know, never buy anything that has single-use disposable plastic and, you know, be a kind of enviro-freak, but, no, but the rest of the world doesn't, then the world won't be healed, and I didn't make a difference there either. So there's this, there's this real sense of, of not being able to make a difference. And yet, the way we got where we are is because that's how we're all behaving. Hundreds of millions of people acting like my contribution isn't going to make a difference. Ah, fuck it. I'll, I'll get the new iPod. I'll get, the, I'll get a new stereo. I'll, get a, you know, I'll take my vacation to Mazatlan. Not, that plane's going to fly there anyway. I might as well be sitting on it. You know, hundreds of millions of people making these kind of unconscious decisions. Well, my contribution doesn't matter. And here we are in a catastrophe as a result. So one of the things I'm interested in is not necessarily flipping the needle to I matter, but convincing myself and others to begin behaving as if we matter, even though we still hold on to this belief that we don't matter. It's like really a fundamental change in behavior. And uh, Wendell Berry said it really beautifully, I thought. He said, a change of heart or mind without a change of practice is nothing more than a, a, uh, a mindless luxury in a passively consumptive way of life. Maybe that's the, uh, the piece of wisdom. <laughs> um, so we're running short on time, so if you both want to ask your question really quickly and then have Chris answer it. I'll speak in double speed. Um, my name is Mubina. I'm a student at NYU at Steinhardt. And um, you talked a lot, a lot about feeling, and I have a question that might come across as being unfeeling. Mm. But um, there are some paradoxes in, in you know, being this very responsible consumer, for example, saving all the dogs and cats and the 1.2 billion people who um, don't get clean water, um, those would be 1.2 billion people who would become consumers, who would just contribute to this problem. And dogs and cats are co consumers as well. Um, so it's kind of like, how do we prioritize? Do we save the white rhino? Do we save the dogs and cats? Do we save the 1.2 billion people? Who has the right to um, make use of these very limited resources? And how do you grapple with that? Huge question. And you, you kind of peripherally raised another, what a lot of people say is the biggest question of all, and that is population. You know, isn't this all just an issue of out-of-control population? And don't we need to start with some kind of population control? And when you start talking about those questions, these ethical issues come up that are just horrendous. To, I mean, it's, it's awful territory to even begin walking into. Like, for example, um, if there's a pandemic, do we just let it happen? You know, I, I can't help but believe that there was something of that going on during, uh, in 1994 when the genocide happened in Rwanda. And uh, it's, I mean, it's just a, it's, you know, do we save the 1.2 billion people who, who lack access to safe, safe drinking water? I can't remember what the number is. It's tens of thousands of babies that are dying a day from lack of access to safe drinking water. If we save them all, then there's more resources that are going to be needed for them. You know, it's just this, like, really awful ethical territory. Um, but I heard a really interesting talk given about population recently that, uh, that sort of took the edge off the issue, for me at least. And that is, the places in the world where population is exploding are all uh, needy countries. Population is not exploding in the United States anymore. It's, it's leveled off, and it's even declining. And it's that way in much of the first world. And people who are going to places like Nigeria and Kenya and Mexico and educating girls about, uh, about family, um, family planning and birth control, 
they, there's this thing called the girl effect, which is really amazing. If you can, in, in, uh, in, in needy places in the world, if you can get a girl to age 20 without becoming pregnant, and, and most of them become pregnant by rape, if you can get a girl to age 20 without becoming pregnant, instead of slipping into a life of poverty as a young woman who's the head of a family with no father around, slipping into a life of poverty and continuing this cycle, she'll become a leader in her community. And the population explosion just comes to a dead halt. And uh, it's fascinating to see, and there, there are activist groups out there who are, uh, who, are, who are all about the girl effect and going and educating young women. Um, and the, you know, the, the effect is, is transformational. And uh, so I'm, I guess you, you can kind of imagine that, that uh, 500 years from now or 1,000 years from now, there's going, to be, there's going to have to be some kind of population control measures. And, uh, but in China, you know, that's the only place in the world where they've tried it so far, and the, the, uh, the ethical implications of it are, are awful. You know, it's, uh, it's something that the people of the future are going to have to wrestle with in, in a really frightening way. Good question, though. Hard question. Take one more? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Stephanie. Um, I'm really grateful to have been here for this. Um, my question is, all of the pictures are of man-made objects, and they all relate to us. So I'm wondering if you will ever take pictures of people and use images mm. of actual living beings, because I noticed even the tiger shot was of something made yeah. by someone of a tiger. Or yeah. would you ever use a real picture of a tiger or a dog, a dead dog, instead yeah. of the <laughs> collar of a dog? Yeah. You know, like, even something that, because I feel like you really want to reach people on an emotional level. And it's this is just another way to kind of filter that ability to feel because we're looking at things, not at the dead tiger. Yeah. So I'm wondering if that's something you're considering doing in the Great future. Great observation. If could, and if you could um, finish up with a picture of the Pacific garbage patch, uh, the, the water oh, patch, garbage yeah. that you were talking about. Yeah. Do you have that? Easy? Well, I think we're out of time, but I'm happy to chat with, that, with, yeah. with, uh, with people about that afterwards. Um, but a uh, really interesting question you raised. A lot of, a lot of my work is influenced by uh, the, a, a trip that I took to the Holocaust Museum and found, you know, there are these piles of, or, or photographs of piles of things like eyeglasses, you know, that represent people who've died. And I, I've used objects to represent uh, people in some cases. And yet there, there are a few issues that I've wanted to address for the longest time. One of them is the number of civilians who've died in the Iraq War, which by, uh, you know, by the best estimate out there, it's a, we've, we've killed about a million Iraqi civilians, women, children, and uh, non-military guys. And uh, I really wanted to do a piece that shows that. Or the number of people who lack access to safe drinking water. And I've tried making pieces that use some object as a stand-in for people, and it just doesn't feel like it honors the issue. You know, there's, there's some issues where I do want to, I want to, it's about people, and I want to show actual people. And uh, I haven't figured out a way to do that yet. Um, I, one way to do it would be to hire uh, about 50 actors and have them all stand in a crowd and take a picture and then have them all sort of mill around and then take another picture and I'd be able to build an image of, uh, of millions of people. And I, I haven't gotten around to doing that, but uh, it's sort of a, it, it is the next logical step for me to take is to make pictures of you know, actual numbers of people. And you know, one of them, there's one issue I've been wrestling with uh, ever since I learned about it about a year and a half ago, and that's modern day slavery. There's another issue that just hit me in the chest when I first learned about it. Um, I read a book about it and then saw a documentary film about it. Do you guys know that there are 27 million people in the world today who are living as slaves? We have the largest population of slaves in the history of the world right now, and 50,000 of them live in the United States. We have 50,000 people living as slaves in the United States today. And most of them are not sex slaves. They're not, they're not uh, women who've been sold into prostitution. About 15,000 of them are. And the rest of them are agricultural workers who are living under kind of grapes of wrath conditions. You know, they're brought from places like Guatemala, and they're, uh, they're paid almost nothing. And the day they arrive on their job, they're given a bag to go pick apples or, or avocados or whatever, and they're charged $10 for the bag. And they don't have any money. So that comes out of their first paycheck. And then they're told, well, you get to go stay in that shack, and that's $5 a week. And your meals are going to be $2 a day. And pretty soon they're in debt. And, and they don't ever get paid a cent. 
they just slowly chip away at their debt. And after three or four years, they finally realize they're getting screwed and they, uh, they try to do something about it. And at that point, they're, uh, they're told that if they go talk to the police or if they talk to anybody else about it, that, that, uh, that their whole family back in Guatemala will be killed. And they just, they, they, they typically last three to four years in a, in a position of slavery. And until finally they break down, they, uh, they have a medical problem or they run away or, or they're rescued. There are groups that are going into farms and rescuing these agricultural workers. But that's one of those issues. I want to show 50,000 slaves in the United States. And uh, that's something, you know, I've tried links of chain and, you know, a whole bunch of things like that, and none of it honors the issue. It has to be people. That's an issue that just has to be fully honored. And uh, I, I just haven't found the depth in my own work to, to get to an issue that's that horrendous. But good question. Thank you for the push. All right, I think we're done, you guys. Thank you all so much for coming. No applause, but uh, thank you so much. Cheers to you all.